So most of you will probably agree that life is the one most important thing on our planet, right? We don't think about this in our everyday lives. But we are part of life, and we depend on a myriad of other living organisms for nearly everything. We need life for the quality of our air, for our food, for our health, for psychological well-being. Life is everywhere. Yet, we know very little about the history of life. And this history is important in the same way that we can't know who we are without knowing our history. We can't understand life around us without understanding its history. And we are at a time where understanding life around us is particularly important because we depend on it and we're dramatically impacting it. We're currently living the sixth mass extinction event after the five that life has already experienced. It is not the first time in its history that major environmental shifts happen and that species go, go massively extinct. We can learn from these past events to better face what is ahead of us. So, understanding the history of life is important, but how can we know about this history? Life began some 3.5 billion years ago. That is 10,000 times older than our own human history. If we fit the history of life on a 12-hour clock, we appeared in the last couple of seconds. There are millions and millions of species. We don't even have a good estimate of how many exactly. So how can we know about this old and rich history? How can we travel back in time, like Marty in Back to the Future? Evolutionary biologists have two types of back-to-the-future car. The first type is fossils, and the second type of back-to-the-future cars is DNA. Well, it turns out I didn't grow up dreaming to dig fossils. I grew up in south of France, Provence, surrounded by beautiful life. Purple lavender in front of my eyes, the scent of cicadas in my ears, the touch of horsehair on my skin, the smell of thyme and rosemary in my nostrils, the taste of blackberry in my mouth, all my senses overwhelmed by life around me. In a way, I was predestined to work with the DNA of present-day species. I didn't study biology, though. I studied mathematics. You can tell I was in a math class by counting the number of guys versus girls on this picture. 29 guys, 10 girls. That is a math class. And actually, the ratio could have been even worse. I liked the universal rules provided by mathematics. It seemed to me that they could somehow say something general about life. I might have heard this quote from Galileo as a kid. The book of nature is written in the language of mathematics. And mathematics were so simple in comparison with the complexity of life. So I studied mathematics, but later on came back to my original passion for the natural world and I was well prepared. Today, I use mathematics, computers, and the DNA of present-day species to understand the history of life. Isn't it remarkable that all living things, including us, us descend from a unique ancestral species? This shared history is still visible in our genes. Life has diverged in many different forms, but we have kept similarities in our genomes. The more closely related two species are, the more similar their genomes. The more distantly related they are, the more dissimilar their genomes. In turn, we can use this similarity between the gene of living species to reconstruct their ancestry. If we do this at the scale of all life on Earth, we can draw the tree of life, a representation of how all living things are related through evolution, akin to a map of life. The leaf of a tree represents the species that we can find on the planet today. The internal branches of a tree represent which species are related to which one and when their divergence occurred. We humans are very, very tiny in this biological universe. We are one of a, um, one of a tiny leaf in one of the tiny branches in this tree that also includes all, mammal, all animals and fungi. This is one of our current vision of a tree of life, and a pretty recent one, actually. 
It was published a couple months ago and made big news. We heard about it in the New York Times, in the TED IDs blog, and even in Paris Match, a pop newspaper in France that usually talks about Shakira. The reason why this tree made such big news is that we had missed a big part of the tree, the blue-purple part here. This group of organisms double the size of one of the three main trunks of life, the bacteria, which you can see on the left. We had missed a huge part of the tree of life. We're looking for life on other planets, but we don't know about life on ours. We need to keep on refining the tree of life on our own planet. But this is not enough. The tree of life reconstructed from present-day species is only part of a magnificent history of life. We are missing all the branches, twigs and dead leaves that didn't leave any descendant in the present. These branches, these dead branches, are the ones we can find in the crust of the Earth, the fossils, like some dinosaurs, recent mammals, marine invertebrates, pollens. But they, these fossils that we can find today in rock formations are only part of the missing branches, and I use mathematics to try to fill the remaining holes. When I see the tree of life, I see the realization of a process, a process in which species diversify and go extinct. If I can build a model that gives a realistic representation of this process and can accurately reproduce the actual tree of life, if I can trust these models, then I can travel back in time by running these models backwards from the present to the past to reconstruct a probable history of life. This, for example, is the most probable scenario of how the number of species of different groups of whales and dolphins varied from 35 million years ago to the present. And this is the most probable scenario of how the pace of evolution varied in various groups of mammals from 60 million years ago to the present. Our model suggests, as you can see, that the pace of evolution has accelerated in the recent past. And we think that this is linked to environmental changes, but this is still debated. The point is that we are able to estimate the pace of evolution in deep time. Using DNA, mathematics, and computers, we can, have, uh, we can reconstruct a probable history of life. I lead an interdisciplinary team of young researchers in Paris dedicating to building the mathematical tools that allow us to understand the history of life. We make all our models and codes freely accessible to the scientific community so that everybody can use them to study the history of a group that they are the most interested in. This is our own scientific way to understand the history of life. What about yours? How can you know about the history of life? How can your children know about the history of life? And also, how can we re keep a record of our life before some of it goes extinct? Museums of natural history are typically where we keep this record of life and where you and your children can go learn about the history of life. And museums are great, but they're not always that fun to go to. You often have to keep quiet. You typically see dead organisms. And also, not everybody has access to museums. And museums can burn. This is what happened to the Indian National History Museum in Delhi last month. Don't take me wrong, we do need natural history museums uh, and also make sure that they don't burn. But we also need a secured, maintained, interactive, easily accessible record of life online. If you want to learn about a place on the planet, if you want to travel virtually from the safety of your home, anywhere on Earth, you, go, you can go on Google Earth and explore even the, rem the most remote, unknown place of a planet online. But what if you want to learn about life on this planet? Where is our Google Earth of life? This is a demonstration of OneZoom, a unique online explorer of life organized around the tree of life. All life can fit within a single page. All you have to do is zoom in to reveal more details of a particular part of a tree, like the apes here. Or instead, zoom out to step back and get a broader vision of where you are in the tree. 
This tree is scientifically accurate. It is based on the most up-to-date scientific knowledge of a tree of life. It is interactive. You can go on its website and play with it. Do you realize the potential of this tree is life explorer? Imagine being able to see at a glance which species are doing well, like the nocturnal curasso in green, or are endangered, like the helmeted curasso in red. Imagine being able to hear the sound of whichever bird species you want from your home by a simple click. Imagine your children going out in nature, taking pictures of a species they see and having an image recognition system that brings them directly to the corresponding species in the tree of life, where they can learn about this species, its history, its role in, in the ecosystem, and its conservation status. Imagine learning about the fungi holding the secret of tasty French cheese and wine or about the bugs responsible for dramatic epidemics, such as malaria. Imagine being able to learn about the vegetable, meat and fish you have in your dishes. All of this on a single website. We're not quite there yet. There's still a lot of work ahead. I recently joined the OneZoom team to be part of the adventure. We need to work with designers and artists to make the tree even more beautiful with educators to help us design educational tools, photographers to contribute astonishing pictures, funders to make all of this possible, journalists, you, to spread the word out. I'm excited to see what this will become and what the impact will be. I strongly believe in the potential of this life explorer to improve our collective understanding of the history of life, our place in this history, our connection with nature and our efforts to preserve it. What will your part be in this adventure? Come with us, join us on this journey. Let's design something mind-blowing. This is about life, and life deserves it. Thank you. Merci.